Hello, business statistics students. This is your instructor, Dr. Todd Daniel, with you to review the highlights of what we learned in our second four weeks of class about central tendency, variability, correlation, and probability. This video can help you with your test preparation, but it is also a condensed review of how we use descriptive statistics as measures of location and variability, how we explore relationships between variables, and how we use probability in business statistics. So I hope that it will be useful to you. So let's get started with some of the terminology that we learned. We began by describing descriptive statistics using central tendency. Now central tendency is a measure of location and it answers the question of where is the center of a distribution. It gives us a single number with which we can use to describe a larger group of numbers. It gives us that benefit of simplification, taking a large amount of information and whittling it down to a single number that we can use for descriptions. But we also looked at variability. That's how spread out the scores are. And we determined that we can have two distributions with the same mean, but different standard deviations. When variability is high, when the standard deviation is large, the scores tend to be spread out around the mean. But when variability is low, when the standard deviation is small, the scores tend to be packed more closely together around the mean. This is also useful for making predictions. A prediction using a mean with a small standard deviation is going to be much more accurate than making a prediction using a distribution with a large standard deviation. The mean is the score at the mathematical center of the distribution. Now typically we are going to use the mean with normally distributed scale level data. The formula for the mean is in the upper left corner. Add up all the scores in the sample and divide by the sample size. But we also learn some alternatives to the mean, such as the trimmed mean, which we tend to use when we have outliers that have skewed the data. The trimmed mean cuts off the upper and lower 5%, giving us a more representative middle 90%. A weighted mean is used when we have both a, an average cost, but the amounts fluctuate, such as buying gas. The average price fluctuates every week, but so does the amount of gas that we buy. So we weight the cost by the number of gallons purchased. The geometric mean is used mostly with financial data for analyzing growth rates, where values in any given day or week are dependent upon values from previous days or weeks. The median is the score at the geographic center of the distribution, in the same way that a median of a road is right in the middle of the road. Mathematically, it's the score at the 50th percentile. We'll use a median if we have ordinal data sometimes, but we will also use the median when we have skewed scale data, such as the value for housing prices, where we have most of the, the housing prices being in a relatively narrow range, and then a few very highly priced houses that would skew the mean and give us an inaccurate measure. In that case, we would use the median. Now the mode, is the most frequently occurring score. And we learned about the unimodal distribution, which is typical of most distributions. It has one major peak. The normal curve, or the normal distribution, is a unimodal distribution. A bimodal distribution has two major peaks. This may occur because there are actually two best times to go fishing, the morning and the evening or it may occur because we have overlapping distributions, let's say from two different colleges. In a normal distribution, the mean, the median, and the mode will be approximately the same. If we have a median that differs from the mean, that can actually become a measure of the skewness of our distribution. In measures of variability, we started with the range and the interquartile range. We would begin by dividing up our distribution into four sections. 25% of the scores are in each section. 
the range is the highest score in our distribution minus the lowest score in our distribution. But the range is highly susceptible to outliers. So another measure that we could use is the interquartile range. This is the variability between the first and third quartiles, or the middle 50% of the scores. It is going to be a much more reliable measure of variability, especially when we have outliers in our data set. We then began to explore the mathematical ways of defining the variability within a data set. We started with deviation scores. One way of measuring variability is how far the scores fall from the mean. So we start by subtracting the mean from each raw score. Deviation scores that are positive are above the mean. Deviation scores that are negative are below the mean. And a deviation score of zero would be precisely at the mean. The sum of squares is where we add up the deviations, but not just the deviations, we have to square them first. Square the deviations, add them up, that's the sum of squares, and then divide the sum of squares by the total number of scores, or n, to get the variance. Now the problem with the variance is that it is measured in squared units. So if our measure was in years, then our variance would be in squared years. So the way that we get around that is we unsquare the variance. We use the square root to create the standard deviation, which is the measure of the average amount of variability in the data set. And the standard deviation will be in the original scale as the data. So let's summarize how we describe distributions. You will recall that we have both categorical or qualitative and continuous or quantitative data. For categorical data, measures of location, we'll use the mode for nominal data and either the mode or the median for ordinal data. The measures of variability for categorical data will be the range or the interquartile range. For continuous data, we will use the mean if we possibly can, but if the data are skewed, we might use a trimmed mean, or in specific cases, we might use a weighted mean or a geometric mean. The variability measures for continuous variables will be the variance and the standard deviation. We prefer the mean and standard deviation. We could also use percentiles or quartiles Remembering that the quartiles are something that we would need in order to, to calculate the interquartile range. When our data are normally distributed, they take on a bell-shaped curve. The skewness for this curve would be zero. The mean and the median would be the same. But when the scores are pulled out to the right, the positive direction, we would have a positively skewed distribution. The measure of the skewness would be positive, and the mean would be pulled out greater than the median. If the scores are pulled out to the left, the negative direction, that is a negatively skewed distribution. The measure of skewness would itself be negative, and the mean is pulled to the left or less than the median. What causes skewness? Well, one cause can be outliers. Outliers are extreme scores. They lie out in the extremes of the curve. Well, which measures that we've already discussed are most affected by outliers? For central tendency, the mean would be affected the most, the median a little bit, but the mode, not at all. For measures of variability, the range is severely susceptible to outliers. The variance and standard deviation will be affected but the interquartile range or the mode would not be affected by outliers at all. A normally distributed curve has a very gentle kurtosis. Kurtosis is the measure of how peaked or flat the curve is. A leptokurtic curve is very peaked. Think of the scores leaping up for leptokurtosis. This would mean the variability would be smaller. Platykurtic curves are flat. The word plat and flat rhyme, or platykurtic like a plate being flat. 
flattening out the curves, increasing the standard deviation or the variability creates a platyhertic curve. But a normally distributed distribution would be mesokurtic, the ideal normal medium amount of curvature. We can describe the proportion of scores under a normal curve using the empirical rule. When a set of scores is normally distributed, 68% of the scores will be within one standard deviation of the mean, and 95% of scores will be within two standard deviations of the mean. This works for a normal curve. But for any curve, according to Chebyshev's theorem, at least 75% of data values will be within two standard deviations of the mean. And again, this works for any data set. The box plot is the graphical representation of the five number summary. Those five numbers are the minimum, the smallest number in the distribution, the first quartile, the 25th percentile, the median or the 50th percentile, also called quartile two, the third quartile, the upper quartile or 75th percentile, and the maximum. The interquartile range is the difference between Q1 and Q3. And the box plot also shows the same kind of information that we would see with a normal curve with standard deviations applied. A correlation is the measure to which two variables are related. And by related, we mean that changes in one variable are consistently associated with changes in another variable. The correlation is the standardized covariance between two variables. A correlational coefficient looks like this. It begins with a lowercase r in italics. Now that r has a very specific meaning. It stands for regression. And the regression line is the line of best fit that runs through the middle of dots on a scatter plot, followed by an equal sign and either a positive or negative sign for the number. The sign, positive or negative, indicates the direction of the relationship, positive or negative. The absolute value of the number indicates the strength of the relationship, with numbers closer to one or negative one indicating stronger relationships and values closer to zero indicating weaker relationships. This is a scatter plot of height and weight. Each dot on the scatter plot is made up of a pair of scores. The total sample size is the number of pairs of scores. The line running through the dots is the regression line. It's a line of best fit and it summarizes the relationships between the two variables. A scatter plot is a graphical display of the strength and the direction of a scatter plot. It's depicted with dots that are called data points, a data point being a pair of X and Y scores. N, or sample size, is the number of pairs, and the regression line visualizes the relationship. The direction of the relationship can be either positive, where both variables move in the same direction. When one goes up, the other goes up. When one goes down, the other goes down. Or a negative relationship, where the variables move in opposite directions. One going up while the other goes down, or one going down while the other goes up. The strength of the relationship is the absolute value of the number of the correlation, values close to zero, are weak relationships. As the relationships move closer to either positive one or negative one, they become stronger. A perfect correlation would be a value of either positive one or negative one. In probability, we learned that probability odds and chances are similar, they are related, but they are not the same thing and they are used differently in statistics. Probability is the likelihood that an event will occur. The odds are the likelihood that an event will not occur. And chances are probabilities that are being expressed as a percentage. 
we can assign probabilities in one of three ways. The classical method is used when the outcomes are equally likely, such as the roll of a die, where each side has a 1 in 6 chance of coming up. Relative frequency assigns probabilities based upon experimentation or historic data. We keep track of the number of people waiting in line at the opening of a business, and those wait times can give us a table of relative frequency that can tell us the likelihood that a person will or will not be waiting at a certain time or on a certain day. The subjective method is really a personalized method. We assign probabilities based upon our experience or our judgment. It's what feels right. And that subjective method, while it can be useful, is even better when it is applied using a relative frequency or a classical methodology, if at all possible. Statistical experiments involve a sample space. The sample space being all possible experimental outcomes. Here the gray rectangle represents the sample space. A sample point is another name for an experimental outcome, uh, the heads or tails in the flip of a coin. An event is a collection of sample points, multiple flips of the coins. And a tree diagram can be used for multi-step experiments, where we get a probability at step one, another probability at step two, another probability at step three, and the combinations of those probabilities can give us a range in which the event is likely to occur. Events are independent when the occurrence of one event does not influence the probability of other events, such as the flip of a coin, or the roll of a die, or the spin of a roulette wheel. Well, this leads us to something called the gambler's fallacy. The idea that after a long string of losses, the next one has to win. If that coin has flipped heads four or five times in a row, it is due to come up tails. When in fact, every flip of the coin still has exactly that same 0.50 probability, assuming that it is a fair coin. In spinning the roulette wheel, if it has landed on red the last four times, that does not mean that black is more likely to come up. The probability will remain the same because those events are independent. Now, if one event is affected by the occurrence of the other event, those events are dependent. For any given flip of the coin, if the coin comes up heads, it now has a zero probability of coming up tails. In that sense, the heads and tails are dependent for a single flip of the coin. But that doesn't change the probability for the next flip of the coin. If two events are correlated, then they will be dependent, assuming they're not correlated at a value of zero. Finally, on the test, you will be given a data set called Physical Activity and BMI.csv. You can open this in either Excel or JASP and complete an answer sheet that has also been provided for you in Blackboard. What you will do is take your answers that you've written on your answer sheet and you will complete part of the test using those answers. So there will be two portions. The first part will be a traditional true-false multiple choice type test. But the second portion will involve writing in the answers that you got when you did your own analysis. You will do that analysis before you begin the test and you will use that answer sheet only on the second part of the test. Well, I hope this video will be useful to you as you prepare for the second unit test or just as a review of what we've learned. Now, you may also want to keep this video in mind as you study for the final at the end of the course. Thanks for watching.